Okay, here's so all uh, all of you are uh, survivors, you know, <laughs> the survivors of the cause of uh, the evolution of consciousness. Uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, so we started with uh, unicellular organisms. They were already choosing something. Then we gradually moved up in the animal kingdom, what what we as humans call move up, and not necessarily the same perspective from other animals. Um, and yesterday I talked about the development of the human mind. So today I would like to discuss a number of issues which are very closely related. So I call it uh, achievements uh, of increased consciousness, but it's maybe more uh, products this, that maybe uh, produce what, what our conscious minds have uh, produced. Um, I think this is the most controversial lecture because I'm going to talk. I, I'm going to give you a couple of my opinion, uh, uh, my personal opinions, which not necessarily is shared by everyone. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to take criticism afterwards. So uh, I will have an open ear. Okay. So why and how did consciousness prevail? Memory, reasoning, and language all co-evolved. Uh, with consciousness and contributed to our potential of delayed gratification. I think that is a very important one in human development, delayed gratification. And there's a number of important chapters in, in uh, consciousness. So I will talk about uh, uh, the dawn of, uh, of consciousness and the rise of religion, and then the secret of language, uh, then the theory of moral luck and our warped reality, uh, then, because I'm a medical doctor, I, will, I, I can't leave you without having, giving you some idea of my personal models of uh, health and, and, and uh, uh, disease. And then I end up with some notes on our free will. So it's quite a heavy program. Uh, first, I'll talk about uh, Michael Graziano and his attention schema theory. He's a psychologist uh, in Princeton. And he says that uh, too much information flows into the brain to be properly, uh, properly processed. So the brain development system to deeply analyze just a few select uh, uh, the brain developed a system to deeply analyze just a few signals at the expense of all others. And we have been you have been hearing about that over the last four lectures. So Hydra, the water animal, shows the same response whatever stimulus. And then the arthropod eye, and it sharpens signals related to visual edges and suppresses other visual signals. All vertebr vertebrates uh, do have a central control system of, of signals, and it's called the tectum, which arose about 500 million years ago. And this tectum constructs an internal model allowing for prediction and planning. And this information is closely shared with the eyes, head, and other major body parts. So in the reptiles and birds, uh, they developed uh, the, what is called a wilst. I don't, uh, the, and in mammals, this wilst, sorry, that second sentence is wrong. Uh, the, in, in mammals, uh, this wilst, this primitive uh, center, developed into a cortex. So the cortex upgraded the tectum well, but rather it's an illumination of signals. Uh, uh, so rather what this cortex does, rather than enlightening everything, it basically takes a spotlight on some signals. Uh, this is according to Francis Crick. And the cortex constants, constantly updates and models the set of information that this, uh, describes what the, the covert attention is doing moment to moment. So we get all the time this information, but all the time it gets updated in real time. Um, now, I mentioned this whole thing of theory of mind. So they are mammals, and they know that other mammals also have a, a mind. And I think uh, dogs, uh, for instance, they, they have that. If I walk with my dog in Newlands Forest and I come at a T-junction, the dog is waiting for me because he doesn't know which, one, which side I'm going to take. Yeah? So he's obviously, he knows what I'm, th uh, 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 what I'm thinking. 
Uh, reptilian, avian, mammalian uh, developed a self model and a, and a social model in tandem. Uh, this also led to what uh, Justin Barrett calls the hyperactive agency detection device. So it's a very expensive uh, or long term. Hyperactive agency de uh, detent, was it? I, can't, I can hardly say it. Hyperactive agency detection device. So, of course, if you're a w living in the wild and there may be uh, predators around, it's very good to pick up that predator because if you miss it, you, you can pay with your life. So it's better to be safe than to be sorry. And I think that also may have to do uh, with the start of religion. So the, the dawn of consciousness and the rise of religion. Men cannot even make a worm, but makes gods by the dozens. Theory of mind, taking another uh, one's perspective, uh, and survival of the most intuitive. And we almost have a pathological ability to recognize faces. faces. Um, uh, as I mentioned to you, I walk in new uh, So this is just in, in the, 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 you even see an, a, a human face on, on uh, Mars. And just in nature, our brain interprets things as faces. Uh, this is just from one of my works. If you walk in Newlands Forest, you can see this. And then, um, the Turin Shroud, uh, uh, I think it's a, a, a fake, but um, the people also saw a face in that. And then people, some people even see Jesus in an Ikea toilet. Um, so we've got an almost pathological ability to recognize faces. So this, this term, uh, I'm very interested, if you go on the internet, you can see, it's called pareidolia, and it's from the Greek para, which means besides, alongside, or instead of. So you see something instead of something else. And you can see on the left side, it's a beautiful tree, and it looks like a ballet dancer. And on the right side, it's uh, some type of orchid. Uh, and it just looks, it's amazingly how closely it resembles a bird. So I think natural religions and uh, the natural world is an embodiment of divinity, sacredness, and spiritual powers. And according to uh, St uh, Stephen uh, Gold, the imagination of early men to purposeful uh, agents behind physical observations. We, I just want to recall uh, yesterday what I mentioned about the dog. If a dog hears the thunder, it really thinks that thunder is meant for him. And that's what I think the natural religion started like this. You can imagine you're walking through a forest and suddenly there's thunder. You must be scared out of your wits. Uh, and you think like, who did that? And you, you, you think there's someone playing with you. And Thor, the thunder god of uh, thunder, is one of the ancient ones. And of course, religions also can make people feel better and improve their fitness and their survival. There's been lots of studies. If you believe in something, it's, it's good for you. Now, from religion, I want to move to the language. And I call it the secret of language, because uh, when I was a young boy, I read a book, and it was called The Secret of Language. <laughs> That's the main reason. But the other thing is, no one we, do, we know very little about language. When did it start? The range of, of, of uh, theories of when it started, it is a massive range from two and a half million years ago till like 50,000 years ago. So we've got really, we've got absolutely no clue. But what we do know, uh, or what I do believe with Charles Darwin is that there can be no doubt that the language owes its origins to the imitation and modification of various natural sounds and men's own distinctive cries, aided by signs and gestures. So there's two, in, in language, there's two main uh, theories as I see it. So there's the language as capstone to human development. So that's sort of like at the end. And then Daniel Dennett, he says it's a it was a launching pad for our cognition, for our understanding. So these are two things. So the one says it was at the basis of becoming human. And the other one says we were already human. And then it's sort of like we achieved that. So I just want to delve a little bit deeper into language. So what is language exactly? 
Now, language, if you analyze it, if you try to think about it objectively, which is very difficult because we use it every day, it is an amazing, a really an amazing phenomenon. Imagine there's a radio station. It creates sound waves. Then there is reception, and then it's translated into messages. I can change all of your guys' brains, believe it or not, without any tricks. If I tell you about a mountain range, um, and I like this example, and just imagine this mountain range, and in the middle of the mountain range there's a flat mountain. Yeah? Flat. Then on each side there's one peak. So I know all of you are thinking about a specific mountain now, Table Mountain. So I had this thought, I was able to, with my breathing and, and with my vocal cords, uh, uh, transforming my thoughts in, a ver in, in words, which is a coded form, this coded form traveled in sound waves to your ears. Your ears pick this um, um, movement up, and then your brain, your radio, or your radio receiver, translated this in the same thing as what I was thinking about. It is a real. It, 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 it's if you if you if you think about it, it's an amazing thing. Now, of course, all theories of language utilize indirect methodologies, fossil, archaeological evidence, uh, contemporary language diversity, uh, studies of language uh, acquisition, and humus, uh, human versus animal communication. Um, there's two main uh, uh, theories, again, in, in what people uh, think of how language could have developed. Uh, then there's is the Steven Pinker, he is the proponent of the gradual or the continuity theory. Uh, so he thinks uh, tiny little steps and then eventually we, we develop our language. Uh, not everyone uh, uh, thinks about it. Noam Komsky, he is a proponent of the discontinuity theory and he thinks something in our brain must have suddenly changed that we can speak because it's such a major advantage uh, uh, if we compare what we can do to, to animals. My personal belief is it's, it's most likely, like with all theories, when there are two extremes, the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I think it is probably most likely continuous, but perhaps punctuated with gene uh, mutations, such as uh, the, the FOXP2 gene I mentioned yesterday. Uh, this morning, uh, when I was doing my ward round in the hospital, we had a child who had an injury in the throat. And what is what is important here is that if you make um, if you make a sound, you've got your air pipe, and this is your uh, your larynx, where your vocal cords are situated. Now, your vocal cords in a child, your vocal cords are sitting much higher at the level of C C3, that's the cervical vertebral body, as compared to an adult where it is much lower at C5 or C6. Now this is very important because the distance between your vocal cord and the base of your tongue determines the variety of sounds you can create. Now in animals, in all animals, that vocal cord sits quite high in the throat. So even a baby, of course, a baby can't talk uh, uh, because he, his brain is or not underdeveloped, but still has to learn. But even if a baby's brain would be able to talk, they wouldn't be able to talk words because the vocal cord is so the different the, the distance between the vocal cord and the base of the tongue is so short that they cannot make the variety of sounds which we need for language. <laughs> Uh, Asia uh, uh, Perelsweg, I don't know if I pronounce it properly, she's a linguist, and she says that if you think about all the different organs we need for speech, we need our lungs, we need our throat, we need our voice box, we need a tongue, and we also need our lips in order to pronounce words. It's extremely unlikely that these structures evolved just because of language, because they're all different. It doesn't make any sense. Other uh, hominoids, they've got no language, 
and probably due to the tongue movements, which is essential, and their voc and the, the vocal cords uh, sitting higher up in the throat and having not the distance to speak. Now, there's been fa fascinating work done by uh, Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza. Uh, he was an Italian uh, geneticist, so he was uh, used to making uh, pedigrees, uh, uh, trees. And then he created this fantastic tree uh, of languages, which I really think was a superb piece of work. So he was able to trace down with a number of words uh, and comparing the different languages. And he realized all of the, the languages must have derived from one basic language. And the one basic language in Europe is called Proto-Indo-European. And it probably uh, uh, was around 5,000 years ago. And it spread gradually. And you can actually follow, in the, in, if you analyze the languages and the dialects, you can follow uh, the, the, the journey of the language. Uh, of course, the real uh, pedigree is not so nice. And there will, there will be uh, blind ending branches. So I think this is more realistic picture. I just want uh, to talk about language. We, 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 we think about knowledge and uh, science. Science is usually in the English language. But science, uh, the language limits our cognition. The language which you use limits your cognition. So the language also. Uh, uh, the language we use determines the way we perceive the world, believe it or not. Uh, we, we see, uh, we, we've been talking about it a lot over the last four days. Uh, in what you've learned uh, determines what you see, but also the language. And for instance, uh, to give you uh, an example, uh, if you go to the aboriginals in, uh, in Australia, these people, in the English language, we use uh, left, right, uh, uh, and, and these things. In the Aboriginal language, they don't have these words. They have only words for north, south, east, and west. They don't use left and right. They, with their body, pick up what is the north and the south, and what is east and what is west. And that is what they use for their direction. We Westerners have lost that skill. We don't. I mean, some of us will probably know where is the north, but most of us not. So in order to speak a language using, a, uh, using cardinal directions, one must stay orientated in order to speak the language. So uh, the, the aboriginals, they have to, in order to communicate, they have to know exactly where they are. Otherwise, they can't communicate properly. So it was originally thought that the humans were uh, biologically incapable of being directionally orientated via cardinal directions, and that only birds and, and other animals were capable. But people can also do that. So depending on the language one speaks, you may or may not uh, require one of the directionally orientated in order to use the, uh, terms of direction while speaking. So just uh, uh, we all think that we are great uh, because we talk the scientific English, which is actually a derogatory t uh, form of English. Uh, we, can, we can communicate in a language, but that language is only one out of approximately, the numbers vary a little bit, but uh, between 5,000 and 10,000, so probably around 7,000. And obviously, we are unable to think in a language we don't know. That's obvious. But it's very interesting that uh, I, I speak just a few languages. Holland is a very small country in between big England, big Germany, and big France. So we were forced at school to learn these languages. And uh, people who visit me from Holland, they always get very cross if I don't talk Dutch to them immediately and fluently. But I cannot. It's, it's a struggle. I, it's not that I forgot how to speak Dutch, but, but I. The, my, my life here is, is in the English language, and this is what I've learned. And I really struggle to suddenly switch over. If I go there for a few days, I become fluent, also in Germany and France. But not, I can't just do it quick, quick. And they always, my friends always call me lazy, and they laugh, and they say, you just don't want to do it. But actually, in the last 10 years, there's been 
um, significant research indicating that if you do a brain scan and you speak in English or you speak in French or German, complete different areas of your brain light up. And that's really amazing. And we, know, we all know, of course, English is a very direct, very descriptive uh, uh, language. Uh, Bertrand Russell is one of my favorite philosophers. He writes so crisp and clear, and he had the Nobel Prize for English literature as a philosopher because he writes so beautiful. Uh, but uh, if you read uh, uh, French or, or German philosophers, uh, Foucault, for instance, I mean, you don't know what he is talking about. You know, I, 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 when you read it, it's really tough. And you have to really uh, apply your mind and, and dig deep into this, and the same for German philosophers. But with the English, it's crisp and clear. It's a completely different language. So, uh, Anne Rand, I, I, you probably know her, uh, she suggested that we should create a, a, a new language without the word I, uh, which we like very much in the Western society. Okay, so that was about language. Now I changed to moral luck, which has not really got to do with consciousness, but a little bit. So most people, they are of the opinion that morality is something which is instilled on a person. Yeah, so we think this is, you go to school, and we're all basically wild animals, and you go to school and we learn about rules and regulations and laws and all that stuff. And then, you know, if you get good parents and a good school, then you become a very uh, moral person. And of course, the behavior of others is either uh, morally superb or disgraceful. But now, interesting enough, the philosopher Thomas Nagel, he, uh, he introduced the term moral luck. Now, it, it, it sounds like an oxymoron. How can you, how can you be moral luck? How, how, does it, uh, how does it work? But listen to this carefully. There is a morally significant difference between a reckless driving and manslaughter. Yeah? We all know this. There's a difference between dri driving off fast and, and killing someone. But whether a reckless driver hits a pedestrian depends on the presence of the pedestrian at the point where he recklessly passes a red light. Someone can be driving his whole life carelessly, terrible, and he could have never killed someone. Another person who, can, who is a superb driver he could have got a phone call that his mother has had a heart attack as in a hospital, and he is completely disoriented. He jumps in the car and he, he, he drives to, this, to, to the hospital and he's in a daze, and, and there's a red robot and he doesn't even see it, and there's a child coming out, suddenly out of the bushes in front of his car, and he drives over the child. He kills the child. He goes to jail, manslaughter, which is so unfair because uh, the other guy, he, is, he, he was always driving uh, uh, unsafe and dangerous, and he doesn't get anything. Well, this one person who makes one mistake and is so-called caught, or has the, per the, 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 the uh, uh, bad luck, he will go to jail. So what happens to us? We always think it depends on us and how good we are, or what comes from inside, uh, so that it is our genes. But it also depends very much on our circumstances. So they call this, with other words, nature and nurture. Uh, but I also think there is something stochastic, so that's like chance. It's just a chance. If a child runs in front of your car and you drive over it, it's, I mean, I, I, it, can, it, it can completely change your life, but it was chance, you know, it was, so how it turns out, the consequences. So I just want to tell you that our reality is completely warped, and I love this saying from Moliere, it infuriates me to be wrong when I know I'm right, and I think we all know this, this is a very familiar feeling. Uh, it is an uncomfortable truth that your perceptions are usually rather inaccurate. It is it's a terrible thing, but it happens all the time. Right? Just a couple of uh, examples. Uh, I, have you seen this gorilla video? 
it's a group of youngsters and they throw over balls, yeah? So uh, th that's in the video and then you are, you are asked how many times do they throw the ball? So you count, you, know, you see this video and you count very carefully. And then in the meantime, while they are throwing this ball, there's a gorilla or men dressed in a gorilla uh, suit. He is, he is moving, uh, jumping in and going in between. But people don't see it because they're counting only the ball. It's really amazing. Uh, so it's tremendous bias. Um, and we, of course, we want to we want to see what we are thinking. We want to get our right. Uh, we see things which are not even there. Uh, first perception. Uh, there's been lots of research. If you go and look for another house uh, to buy another house, be very careful which house you visit first, because your first uh, the first house you visit is the the gold standard. Everything will be related to that house. You know. Uh, it's quite even the price and, and the, the number of rooms and everything. That's just how our brain works. Uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. So people don't, not all people believe in a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I guarantee you, if you uh, think your wife is unfaithful to you, and you repeat it to her every day, you know, you tell her, what have you been up to today? Where were you today? If you keep on doing that for a long period of time, it's going to happen because you're forcing her to do it because she's getting upset with you, you know? She's getting ir irritated, she's getting so dis, uh, 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 um, was it so, so unhappy with, with you that she will look for someone else because you are distrustful of her. Um, focusing on one thing make you blind for another. We talked about it. Mood. The day, Monday morning, the earth is the same as Friday afternoon, but we perceive it very different. Myth, superstition. Um, we never know all the facts. We can only see what happens. If some driver, uh, uh, and in Cape Town, the traffic jams are horrific, and all of us struggle, you know, you in the traffic jam, and then a, a, a car suddenly cuts in front of you, and you get so annoyed. You really get so annoyed because it's, and, and you, you want to hoot and, or scream, and, but we don't know what is the reason this driver, we can only see that he's cutting in front of you, but he may be on his way to hospital to see his child who is dying uh, or whatever. We don't know, but we, we judge the world on facts and not on, on motives. Um, and all memories, all memories we've got are Bill uh, reconstructions, and I think I mentioned in the second lecture, if something terrible happened to you, praise the Lord that we can change our memory. If something horrific happened to us, praise, play, really praise the Lord that we can change it, because otherwise, if, imagine to have the suffering and the burden of these terrible events uh, 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 fresh in your brain all the time. It's really, it's a, it's a great, uh, 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 we live uh, in grace that we, we don't have to do that, that we can change our memories. So I just want to mention, uh, because it's also part of my lectures on child abuse, uh, selective, I call it selective indignation syndrome. Uh, circumcision, if I talk, if I ask my medical students who, is in, uh, who thinks uh, male circumcision is child abuse, can I see any hands? Uh, it's quite a few. That's quite nice. Uh, usually I'm the only one. <laughs> uh, but then if I ask you, is female uh, circumcision uh, child abuse? You see, almost every, almost everyone. Yeah? But, uh, but, but still, uh, there is not much difference between these two. Male circumcision, I mean, it just we recently we've been reading it. It kills about 100 little boys a year uh, from infection and bleeding. None of these little boys ask to be circumcised. It is a physical damage, and, and it, it kills children. How can we tolerate it? So it's a completely culturally uh, uh, determined. Um, female circumcision, of course, is very different. Um, and it's, it's performed only in a few countries, I think, Egypt, Sudan, Sahad. Um, but it's very similar from my perspective. Now, of course, the argument against circumcision are autonomy and physical integrity, but on euthanasia and gender reassignment, we are enlightened. 
to attribute will and opinion to children. But we don't, we don't uh, uh, attribute will and opinion to children when it goes about bad things which we don't like, like smoking, using drugs, or even having undergoing surgery. I really got a problem, I'm a pediatric surgeon, but I really got a problem that parents decide for the child if he, if he needs an operation or not. Where, 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 where did we get this notion from that children can't decide for themselves? If you know that the children, I, and I see f children suffering tremendously under huge operations, and I really think, wh where do we always have the right as adults to just tell someone else who's smaller and weaker than us what is good for him? I, I don't really think so. And of course, I mean, from the Cartesian uh, uh, dualism, there's a mind uh, dichotomy. Uh, we, we all, in, in, in South Africa, I'm, I'm very grateful that, because when I came here, uh, corporal punishment was still allowed in schools, which is really amazing to me. In Holland, parents are not even allowed to hit their children. And I come here to South Africa, and the teachers, someone who's got, who's got no relation with a child, is allowed to, to hit your children. I, I was really horrified by that. And of course, for, fortunately, that has changed now, but still, you know, the mind and body is the same thing, and we do not have the same for mental punishment, because mental punishment, as we all know, can be far worse than physical punishment. So we, if I ask most of you, like, can a tree feel and respond on face value? Of course, we all say no. Now, it's interesting that Peter Wolle, when he wrote a book, uh, he's a forester in West Germany, and he discovered remnants of an ancient beech tree still kept alive by surrounding young beech trees. They're pumping sugar into the stem. Now, uh, we live in Africa, and you probably know that it's really it's an amazing thing. Bread, so on acacia, uh, after, uh, if a giraffe starts nibbling on it, after about 20 minutes, uh, the giraffes leave. Uh, and they walk to another tree, which is at, uh, uh, at least 100 yards away. And the reason for that is that when you start nibbling on the tree, it produces a bitter toxin, and it goes through the whole tree. So this, this uh, giraffe or any animal, they don't like it anymore because it's bitter. We know our body has been conditions, uh, have been conditioned to not tolerate bitter because it's poison. Um, but besides the fact that the tree produces this toxin, a bitter toxin. It also actually produces a gas. Can you believe it? An ethylene gas. And it warns the other trees up to 100 yards. So the giraffe has to, cannot just go to the tree next door. He has to go 100 yards. And actually, I was in Thorny Bush just last uh, two months ago. And uh, the farmers were telling me they had this wa the game farms. And the, the animals, the big animals, they were dying because there were gates between the, the, there were fences between these farms. So they start eating the one tree and the tree warns all the other trees in the surrounding so the animals can't eat them. They have to go walk a long distance. So only when they removed all the gates between these wild, small wild farms, then the animals start to, to produce, reproduce uh, 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 rapidly. So trees can, w trees can warn each other of impending danger, but subsequently this phenomenon has also been discovered recently, very recently, uh, 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 in, in beeches, spruces, and oaks, uh, not only via the mechanism of releasing bitter toxins, but when a caterpillar takes a bite out of a leaf, this leaf uh, produces an electric impulse very, very close, closely resembling our nerve system. And I'll show you. Just listen, uh, watch this video. Very recent video. When a bug tries to bite you, you can always swat it away. Unfortunately, most plants don't have that luxury. What they do have, scientists have just discovered, is an innovative system of communicating danger to their other parts, using some of the same signals as an animal nervous system. Researchers have shown that plants can sense the touch of a caterpillar's tiny toes and respond defensively. Scientists made this discovery as they were investigating how plants sense gravity. 
They suspected calcium signaling was involved, so they genetically engineered an arabidopsis to glow brighter whenever calcium levels increased. When they observed the plant under a fluorescence microscope, they then realized that calcium was dramatically increasing in response to moon data. So how do plants know to go on guard? It starts with a chemical, an amino acid called glutamate. Any type of agitation, from a bug bite to a mechanical cut, causes the release of glutamate, activating receptors that trigger a calcium-based signal that moves through the plant. The signal travels the green highway of the plant's vascular system in just one to two minutes, activating defense hormones that prepare distant leaves for an impending invasion. By gaining a better grasp of this process, researchers can better monitor signaling, and someday may be able to manipulate plant communication. So the next time you brush up against a plant, know that they are feeling your every touch. When a bug tries... So our mind has limited and very often doesn't see and grasp things. And there's just no normal reasons for that. Things may happen uh, uh, too quickly to be noticed. Or, uh, like Table Mountain, it's growing but you can't see it, it's going too slow. Uh, or it may not be growing actually, it may be getting smaller, but we can't notice it because our life is minuscule compared to uh, the eons, the, the mountains is there. A relation often uh, is not direct and it requires often a, a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, a new spectacle, a new perception to see things. So one of the most pretentious assumptions is that we, humans, are above nature. I, I find it amazing if you hear people talk and they say, I don't like nature. <laughs> if you like it or not, but you are nature. Yeah, there's no choice. Uh, and I think it's part of uh, what Daniel Dennett uh, uh, describes as Cartesian gravity. So always our, our, our thoughts condense to body and mind. And we are, uh, we are thinking ourselves so much on the top of the pyramid and on top of the animals and the flower kingdom and the, animal, the, the flower kingdom and microorganisms that we, we think we've got a special place. In popular language, it is wrong to tamper with nature. Yeah? That's what we, we, we tend to say. Because we, we have, nature is, is not from us, but we must leave nature as it is. But I don't think beavers who do chains, the flow of rivers, uh, uh, are called environmental terrorists. In fact, all living things tamper with nature. It's, it's a two-way street. Natural health shops, they contain millions of bottles and tablets of all kinds of stuff. So most uh, people is, uh, associate vitamins with health but they have no idea how disastrous they can be. Actually, preservation, the most common use preservative is vitamin C, uh, uh, as ascorbic acid. And it's very good to prevent scurvy. And I think maybe it may be the reason that we sitting here in Cape Town because the VOC decided to have a, a fruit and vegetable garden here in the Cape. But there's no uh, proven effect of vitamin C on, on viral infections. Now the flu, or the common cold, is a viral infection. And the whole world is taking vitamin C, but there's no sense to it. Absolutely no factual reason to suppose that what is natural is good, and that what is, and that what is unnatural is bad. So in, in the philosophy of Hume, matters of fact, are never enough to establish a matter of value. With other things, they are two completely, according to Hume, complete different domains. The domains of opinion and the domains of facts. And they, you can never use a matter of fact as a reason for your opinion. So to say that something is natural uh, is a fact. It can never be a reason to say that it is good or bad. The whole natural movement is loaded with values, like they use exploitation of nature, disturbing the natural balance, harming the environment. But to say things are good or bad is only possible, only possible 
from a certain perspective. Uh, my favorite example is from when I was very young. If a lion eats a lamb, a lion eats a lamb, it's fantastic news for the lion, you know, because he just fills his stomach. He had a wonderful meal. But it's very, very bad for the lamb, because the lamb disappeared, and his mother is going to miss him now. So there's also always uh, your value is from a certain perspective. OK, as I said, I can't leave without talking a little bit about what about some thoughts of which I have about uh, health and, and disease. So uh, many people have this idea in their head. Yeah, you're either sick. It's a binary system. You're either sick or, or you're or healthy. And then there's also people they say there can be something uh, like neutral in the middle. Um, there's also people who think it's a seesaw, you know? You, you can never be 100% healthy. It's always, you're always sort of like up and down, like mood swings, you know? You, it, it's part of life. Now, according to the uh, uh, Amatya Singh, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, people, Health is one of the capabilities that add value to human life. I think that's very much true. If you ask anywhere in the world people what is the most important in their life, they usually don't say money or their car or their wife, usually say it's their health. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, spiritual, and social well-being. Being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. I think that's a rather ridiculous statement because it makes all problems health problems. So physical well-being is understood as the, uh, as the proper functioning of the body or the state of the organism whereby the organism is disposed to function well. I think that's a more humble, modern uh, proposal. Failure, uh, or a definition of disease, failure of the adaptive mechanism of an organism to counteract adequately, normally, or appropriately the stimuli and stresses uh, to which it is subject, resulting in a disturbance to, uh, in the function or structure or some part of the organism. Labeling someone as diseased can have enormous, enormous individual, social, financial and physical implications. Now, there's two b big groups uh, talking about the definition of disease. The, the naturalists, they say disease is an objective entity which you can measure, like temperature or number of organism. And then there's normativists, and they, they emphasize the subjective nature of the disease experienced, uh, and it differs very much between cultures and through history. I think the, norma the, the normativists are probably right. So when I trained uh, at uh, Erasmus University in Holland uh, a long time ago, they taught us this model. And it, I was quite uh, flabbergasted when I came to Cape Town, because at, at the UCT, they don't teach this at all. They, they, they look for origin of disease in the body. While we have been taught that if you look here, uh, physical uh, diseases are only like a quarter. Psychosomatic is 50%, and psychiatric, pure psychiatric mental problems is also about 25%. Now, what are psychosomatic? So it's, I'm talking about that the mind, that the cause is that the mind and the body is the same thing. So if the one is sick, the other one is also sick. So psychosomatic uh, pains are our, our, our life is full of them. Headache, we talk about headache more than any other pain. And headache is a complete mental uh, entity. If you do a brain operation, you can make a little bit of, lo you can give a little bit of local anesthesia to the scalp and the, and, the, and the bone. And then, if you make a little hole, you can spoon out the whole brain 
and a person who is awake doesn't feel anything. There is no pain perception in your brain. Brain tissue in itself has got no pain perception. So all what if you get a headache, it's, it, it can be in your scalp, it can be your muscle, and I'm usually a tension headache, but it's not in your brain. Although we all think headache is your brain is getting too much information and can't cope. And it feels like the pain is in your head. That's that's false. There is no you cannot have pain. You can take the whole you can it's really amazing. I've seen operations. You can uh, remove big parts of the brain. The, the person is lying on the operating table, talking, and he doesn't feel anything. Suddenly he can't move his right arm anymore, but he is not aware of it. He doesn't feel anything when the brain is taken away. Um, backache. Uh, anyway, I, do, I, don't, I don't want to go into other pains, but just psychosomatic pains is a big part of our life. Now, Kelly, he uh, developed the construct theory, and he says that anticipation and prediction are the main drivers of our mind. A person's processes, he says, are psychologically channeled by the way in which he anticipates events. So psychologically speaking, you slip into the grooves which are cut out by the mechanism which he has adopted for realizing his objectives. So basically, he tells us we are caught in our own framework. So now I come to more controversial areas. Notes on the free will. So we all know this uh, uh, poem, not all, but most of us will know, uh, the famous poem which uh, Nelson Mandela quoted, Invictus. Um, and it was by William Ernest Henley. And the, the main sentence of this famous poem is, I am the master of my own fate. I am the captain of my soul. Because that's what we feel. Is that really true, or are we just marionettes, like the picture on the right, which is Don Quixote and his horse? So what uh, people know about the poem from uh, Henley, the, uh, but not all people know what was the story behind it. The story behind it is that he was, as a boy of the age of 12, he contracted uh, tuberculosis. When he turned 25, so he was sickly his whole life, when he was 25, he developed an infection on both his legs. So the doctors, they informed him that they had to cut off his leg and the other one if he was going to survive. At that moment, on that evening, he wrote the, the poem. So in spite of these terrible circumstances, he wrote that poem. So, uh, when people ask me, is there a free will, this morning uh, Mede asked me, do you think we've got a free will? The most important thing is that to realize the question is not a simple, it's not a binary. You've got free will or you've got no free will. Your legs can move your body, but only when there's a surface. So we can choose to walk, but only on the surface. We can't walk in the air. Fish have a greater mobility. They can, they can go all over the show. But they can't, I mean, they can jump out of the water, but only once, then they die. Uh, these, these are one of my favorite birds, uh, the black neck cranes. They are Japanese uh, cranes. They fly over the Himalaya. So can you imagine, that's the place where aeroplanes fly at 10 kilometers high. The Himalaya is nine kilometers high. So these birds are, un it's, it's unbelievable. They can fly, and there's a place where it is minus 40 and it's, there's hardly any oxygen. So they can fly there. But they, don't, they can't go higher. There's a ceiling for them. So they can fly in a certain level of the air, but they can't go higher. So it's very tough for us to imagine we don't have a free will. Now, uh, in 1980, that's now 40 years ago almost, was it? Uh, 40, yeah, 40 years ago. Uh, Benjamin Libet, he did a number of experiments. 
And when we consciously choose something, if you measure the brain uh, uh, electric, uh, the microcurrents, it shows that the decision when you do something was already made in your brain. If you look at the EEG, you can see the person is going to press now the button. And there's a gap of 0.2 seconds. So before we become consciously aware of something, the decision in our brain has already been made. It is just sent to the conscious part as an afterthought. So uh, research published in uh, uh, 2007, it shows that advanced functional MRI, it indicates that uh, uh, some part of the cortex, frontal parietal cortex and the precuneus can reliably detect pressing of a button a full 10 seconds before you do it. So before I'm going to pick up this bottle, probably 10 seconds ago already, if you, if you start doing all kinds of tests, you know that I'm going there and I'm going to grab that bottle. And of course, uh, I, I, the terrible uh, uh, research from Stanley Milgram and uh, Philip Zimbardo in 1964, they basically uh, did, they, they did research with students and they measured how much pain an ordinary citizen uh, would inflict on another person simply because he was ordered to, to do so by a scientist. So there were shocking findings. There was extreme willingness of adults to go to almost any length uh, on the command of an authority, uh, uh, considered the chief finding of, of, of the study. Ordinary people, simply by, by simply doing their jobs and without any particular hostility on their part, they could become agents in a terrible destructive process. And we know this. We know this. A couple of world wars. What uh, Rwanda, Burundi, people are friends, suddenly become each other's enemies. Even when the destructive effects of their work became patently clear, and they are asked to carry out actions incompatible with fundamental standards of morality, relatively few people have the resources needed to resist uh, authority. And once again, it is your perspective. Yeah. So both the Democratic and the Republicans, they're looking at exactly the same, at exactly the same thing, impeachment. And the Democrats says it's important work, and we all know what the Republicans <laughs> say. So talking about the free will, I, 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 maybe because I'm a human being, uh, I like to compare it to human functions. So I think my prostate is slowly growing, and I have to go more often to the <laughs> toilet. Of course, I've got a choice not to go to the toilet, but the choice <laughs> is only for a limited time. <laughs> There is a limit to my free choice. We can hold our breath, but not for very long. And I often use uh, the word blinking or, or winking. We can blink, we can choose. I, I think there's some cell phone going off. OK. <laughs> So we can consciously blink or wink with, with our eyes a few times, but even if we don't do it consciously, our eyes, because they have to make, to, to, the, our eyelids have to keep our eyes moist, they'll do it 30,000 times by themselves. So we, we have this idea that we have free choice, but it's limited. Now, uh, we think that uh, we, 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 you choose your partner all by yourself, but uh, Klaus Wedekind in 1995 published, published the sweaty t-shirt test. So he, sh he, he demonstrated that uh, the major histocompatibility complex, which is a, cell of, uh, a set of cell surface proteins,